Welcome to the Marriage Day Podcast. I'm Jimmy Evans. This is my wife, Karen. We're so glad that you're joining us. We're doing a series of programs on faith and about literally on the life of Abraham. And in this program, I'm talking about some of the fallacies of faith. You're really going to like this program because we're talking about the issue of grace, the the way that we see God Mm -hmm. and the importance of seeing him through the lens of grace. Before we go to the teaching, we're going to answer a couple of questions. If you have questions that you would like to submit to us here, uh, you can go on marriagetodaypodcast.com. Submit your questions. We would love to answer them right here on the podcast. Karen, you have a question first? No, you do. Well, I have. That's right. (laughs) My husband grew up in the church and has experienced a lot of hurt during the times he was actively serving. It's now hard to get him interested in going, and he isn't interested in being a part of any kind of small group. I feel lonely and want us to be a part of a church community together. What do I do? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think we can all say that at some point we've been hurt in church. Um, uh, So I would say with her, this this situation is not unusual. It's just that I'm concerned about him being able to forgive what's happened to him Uh and to get healing for his own personal hurts. Um, You know, so I would just say, you know, you know, find someone, a counselor that can talk to both of you and um, do more of the, you know, what's in him. Not that it's about church, but what's not healed and what he needs to forgive. You know, and he, it may be one of those things where he needs to do the 21 day he, inner healing. Yeah. You know, that app is, you know, we have that app on our website. And, um, you know, just to face the, the fact that that's crippling. You know, when you have that kind of hurt from uh, a community of, what we call our family, you know, because it's it's their family no matter what. If he's yeah. a Christian, that's their family. Right. And just like we would expect them to get marriage counseling, you know, if he's split from um, the body of Christ, he needs to get help. He needs to get family counseling for, you know, bringing him back into the church. Yeah, absolutely. The um, forgiveness is the main issue here. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to, uh, we've all been hurt in, in relationships. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we need each other. When you say you're lonely, that's exactly right. You, you would be lonely because you're isolated now. Mm-hmm. But um, anytime you've had a bad experience, you know, I, when I was learning to fly, I and mean, I'm a pilot, when I was learning to fly, uh, I had a horrible landing one day in Sherman, Texas, basically a crash, <laughs> and a controlled crash. And I pulled the plane, and I was by myself, and I pulled the plane over under the tower and I sat there and I thought to myself, if I don't take back off, I'll never fly again. And I had to sit there and go through the sequence of what just happened Mm -hmm. and to get the courage to take back off. And I think, what went wrong? I mean, and counseling can definitely help. What went wrong? What what caused this crash, this situation, and get help for it? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you did something to make it happen. I mean, you know, you, you could have been contributing to it. But the fear of being in church mm-hmm. is a bad fear to have because mm-hmm. you need to be in church. We need each other. Let me, uh, you think you have one for me? Yeah. Okay. Before we got married, we talked about having kids about two years into marriage. We now at, are at that point, and my husband is ready to start having children. But I don't want to right now because I don't feel like he has his priorities straight. I told him I need him to be the leader of our family if we are going to have kids, but he's made it pretty clear that he's not going to do that. What kind of conversations do we need to have to change this? We were having the right conversations. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems to me like um, uh, children are a huge issue. Um, You, they, before they got married, they agreed on when they were going to have kids. And now he wants to have kids. And she's saying he's not grown up enough, basically is what I hear her Mm -hmm. saying. And and he says. She wants him to be the leader. She wants him to be the leader. And he says he wants to do that. Well, uh, leadership is one of the four primary needs of women in marriage. Um, And women don't want to be dominated, but they want their husband to be the loving initiator of the finances, Mm -hmm. the children, spirituality, romance, Mm -hmm. things like that. You want me to be that, Mm -hmm. not to dominate, but to to initiate. And children need a father that is the loving initiator. They need to see that in him. And they don't need a mother to you know, like this, you know, they need a a mother and father like this, but the father is just the loving leader in that relationship. So I don't think there's anything wrong um, with this conversation. I think that, and I would, I would kind of side with her because if she's saying, I want to have kids too, but I'm concerned about your behavior. Well, maybe he has father issues. Maybe he's never seen a good role model of what marriage is supposed to look like with kids. Exactly. I'd get counseling. Mm -hmm. I think you need to go get counseling. You need to 
uh, maybe he needs a good role model, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. but I, I would definitely get counseling, but this is a serious deal now. Because when you're talking about having children and you are so concerned with your husband's behavior that you don't want to have kids with him, it's a big deal. Uh, I, I would definitely get help in this mm -hmm. situation. We hope that's helpful to you. We're going to go now to this teaching on I Am Abraham. I believe this will be a huge blessing to you. Watch this. You want to live to a ripe old age? You want to be blessed in all things? When you have a child, you want your child to live to a ripe old age, be blessed in everything? That's the blessing of Abraham. And it says that Jesus came to remove the curse to give us the blessing of Abraham. It says another important thing here, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Well, wh who is the Holy Spirit? Well, first of all, the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is not an it. He is a he, and he is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father, in God the Son. He's a part of the Trinity, the Godhead. And so the Holy Spirit is God. Jesus said, it is better for you that I go away. Because when I go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit back to you. The Holy Spirit is a gift of grace. The Holy Spirit is God. We do not deserve Jesus. We do not deserve salvation as a gift of grace. We also do not deserve the Holy Spirit. He is a gift of God into our lives. You can't deserve the Holy Spirit. You can just receive him. And so he is a gift. And he is the delivering agent of every blessing of God in our lives. See, everything that Jesus died to give you, the Holy Spirit imparts, is you believe in him and walk with him by faith. And so Jesus became a curse for us so that the curse of sin could be removed, so that by grace the Holy Spirit could come into our lives and restore to us every single blessing that God wants for us. So that's very important. Let's look for just a minute that's the foundation. The foundation of our faith is grace, the grace of God, and God's great love for us. That's what faith focuses on, okay? So let's talk about Abraham for just a minute. Well, did Abraham walk by faith in God's grace? I mean, Abraham was a pretty, you know, pretty unbelievable guy. I mean, he was the father of the faith, and God did some pretty unbelievable things for Abraham. So the question is, is Abraham like us? I mean, was Abraham kind of special? When God chose Abraham to do all the things that he did, was Abraham chosen because he was kind of like a cut above, he was like a, a super man of faith, or was he like us, kind of messed up and kind of needing a whole lot of grace? Now listen, Abraham was a very messed up guy. Just like, a, isn't it comforting to know that other people are messed up? Yeah, I don't like hearing about perfect people, it makes me nervous. I kind of like hearing about everybody else's problems. It makes me feel better. That's shouldn't say that, but really. So <laughs> Abraham is an example to us because he's just like us. Now this is Genesis chapter 12. And Abraham did some remarkable things. There's no doubt about that. But he did some unremarkable things too. And this is one of them. In Genesis 12, verse 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. Now he's journeying. He just started his journey. And he's journeying through the promised land. To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west, Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Now there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife... Indeed, I know that you're a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Now, let's wait just a minute now. Abraham's in his mid-70s. When Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, he was 75 years old. So Abraham has just begun his journey. Okay? So he's in his mid-70s. He will be 100 years old when Isaac is born. 20, 25 years from here, his first son will be born. So he's going through the promised land. He's coming through the promised land, and God meets him there. And God says to him, I'm going to give your descendants this land. This, this land will be to your descendants. Okay? And Abraham built an altar and worshiped him. Okay? He has no descendants. He has no child. And so if he dies, there is not going to be a fulfillment of that promise. So immediately following that event, Abram is, his name hadn't been changed yet. Abram is going down and there's a famine in the land. So he has to go down to Egypt. Now, Sarah must have been very beautiful. So listen, listen. 
He says to his wife, Sarah, you're so beautiful that when we go to Egypt, I know that Pharaoh's going to hear about it. He's going to take you. So in the, in the Hebrew, the word Sarah means hot. That's a joke. Okay, so anyway, never, nah, never mind. So Hottie McHottridge, she's hot. So she's, they're going down to Egypt. She is so beautiful that he knows that when they get there, Pharaoh's going to want her. Okay, And he turns to Sarah, because of his fear now, he turns to Sarah completely omitting the promise that God just gave him. Completely omitting that promise. And he doesn't say, he doesn't say, you're so beautiful, I think Pharaoh's going to want you, and they may kill me. He doesn't say that. He said, they will kill me. We're going to go to Egypt. Pharaoh's going to hear about your beauty. He's going to want you. They're going to kill me. If any of you struggle with faith, here it is right here. Abraham was a man just like us. Let's keep reading here. It's very interesting. Verse 13, we're continuing. Please say that you're my sister, that it may be well for me for your sake that I may live because of you. So it was, Abram came into Egypt, and the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here's your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. And they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Well, first of all, being Sarah's brother paid pretty good. <laughs> you know. So when Sarah went into Pharaoh's house, he starts getting male and female servants, camels, donkeys, all this kind of stuff. So he's, as he's sinning, God's blessing him. That's what you call grace. I'm not saying go home and sin, but I'm just saying we're always messed up. <laughs> we're, never doing, we're never doing exactly right, right? If the devil ever told you you don't deserve to be blessed, you know the problem with that? It's true. I don't deserve to be blessed. That's why I need the grace of God. You know, I'm not perfect. The Bible says all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. You know, you know where my righteousness comes from? The blood of Jesus Christ. I don't deserve nothing. I don't deserve nothing. And I get blessed anyway because of the grace of God. Somebody say amen. It's good news. It's good news. Abraham's messed up. He's making a big mistake here. Now, he was a good man. He, he did a lot of good things for God, but he still made some bad mistakes. But the problem with this mistake is he did it twice. If it wasn't dumb enough for him to do this once, he did it twice. This is Genesis 20. Abram journeyed from there to the south and dwelt in the land of Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. Now, Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you're a dead man because of the woman whom you've taken, for she's a man's wife. Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, She is my sister, and she even herself said, He is my brother? In the integrity of my heart, in innocence of my hands, I have done that. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now restore, uh, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. Okay, so, so he does it a second time, but that's not the worst part. His son Isaac does it again to Abimelech. Isaac had a wife who was very beautiful named Rebekah. He goes down there to that same area, and he has the same fear. This is called a generational sin that's transferred from generation to generation, and now Abraham's son to the same king does exactly the same thing with his wife, Rebecca, and says, I'm afraid that they're going to kill me because of you, and says that she's her sister, his sister. And of course, he's found out later and everything like that. So let me go back and say this. My faith is not in my goodness. I'm not good, I'm not good enough. I'm not good. I'm not good compared to God. I mean, compared to other people, I may be good, but I'm not good compared to God. My faith is not in my righteousness. I'm not righteous. I mean, all my righteousness is like filthy rags. My faith is in the righteousness of Jesus that comes as a free gift to me. I don't deserve anything. And when the devil comes to me and tells me I don't deserve anything, I totally agree with him and I begin to praise Jesus for his blood. When the devil tries to tell me I'm no good, I agree with him. I'm not good, but I'm good in God. I'm the righteousness of God. 
I can have everything freely by God. It's not about me. See, the law is about me. Grace is about Jesus. Abraham, see, here's the thing about Abraham. When it's about you and you fail, you give up because you're overwhelmed. Abraham failed, but he didn't give up. You know why he didn't give up? Because God didn't give up on him. You know why God didn't give up on Abraham? Because of grace. Grace doesn't give up on people. Grace believes in people. Grace is merciful. Grace, grace is forgiving. The law is unforgiving. The law points its finger at us and says, you better perform, you better obey, you better do right. It's all about us. But grace is all, remember, Abraham came before the law. Abraham came before Moses. He wasn't under the law. He was under grace. And Abraham was able to accomplish everything he was able to accomplish because he just walked in the grace of God. He made mistakes. You know, some of them he learned from, some of them he didn't. But he was still a good man. God still used him in a great way. And I'm saying about you, don't you let the devil put your eyes on you. Don't you let the devil make it about you. Your God believes in you, and even when you make mistakes, God's not going to give up on you. Somebody say amen. Here's things that we believe about faith that just simply sometimes aren't true. Now, you may not believe all of these, but you may believe some of them. Number one, not everybody has faith. It's a special gift. You look at Abraham and say, well, I'm not like Abraham. I don't have that much faith. You have as much faith as Abraham. Here's what Romans 12 says. I say through the grace given to me. Listen. I say, Paul says, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Did you know God gave Pharaoh and Abimelech a measure of faith? By the way, did you know this? When you were not a believer, God gave you the grace of faith to believe. Did you know that faith is given by God? Every unbeliever has enough faith to believe in Jesus, or God couldn't require of them that they did. Faith is a gift, and every person has been given a measure of faith. You have a measure of faith, okay? Number two, fallacy about faith. It takes a person of great faith to do great things for God. Absolutely not true. And this, these are the words of Jesus, well, Luke 17, verse five. The apostle said to the Lord, this is interesting because the 12 apostles they were normally called disciples, but now they're called apostles as though they've been given kind of like a promotion. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. They go to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. Sounds like a good prayer. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and planted in the sea and it would obey you. And which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat. But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and ser serve me till I've eaten and drunk? And afterwards you will eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise you, when you've done all those things which you're commanded say, we're unprofitable servants, we have done what was our duty to do. So the apostles walk up to Jesus one day and they've been, you know, they've been casting out demons and healing sick people and doing all kinds of miracles. And it's like they're ready for more. And they believe that they need more faith to go out and do bigger miracles. So they come to Jesus and they say this prayer to them, to him, Lord, increase our faith. But they're going to get rebuked for it. They're going to get a real sound rebuking for this. But they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, in increase our faith. Very religious prayer, isn't it? I want mountain moving faith. I want raise the dead faith. I want powerful faith. I want people to fall down when I walk by. I want that kind of faith. 
And see, you always hear about people that have that kind of faith, but they always live somewhere else, not here. Over in Africa. Over in China. You know? Well, that kind of faith does exist here. So Jesus, Jesus said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, like a grain of sand, a mustard seed is a tiny little grain of sand seed. If you had faith like a mustard seed, you could speak to that mulberry tree and cast it into the ocean. We are the person that was perishing. We were perishing in our sins and we called out to God. And God saved us and God gave us a promised land in Jesus. The curse is gone. The blessing has come back. And he sent his Holy Spirit, the Spirit of grace, to live with us, to be our friend and our partner. And he is all-powerful, and he's all-knowing, and he's sweet, and he's always with us. He's our helper that never leaves our side. And he is very loving and very attentive, and we don't have to beat him with a bigger stick to get a bigger miracle. And that's exactly what the disciples were saying. When the apostles came up to Jesus, they were saying, Oh, Lord, we, we've done all these mighty miracles. Now, could we have a bigger stick? You think you have to beat God with a bigger stick? It doesn't take a lot of faith to get a miracle out of God. It's not about the size of our faith. It's about the size of his heart. He loves us. He loves us. He's for us. He's on our side. All we have to do is tell him what we need and just reach out and touch him with our mustard seed faith. It's all about God. It's all about his grace. You say, Pastor Jimmy, I don't have much faith. You have enough faith to get anything you need from God because he is madly in love with you and he cares about you. Somebody say amen. It takes a lot of faith to get a miracle. No, it doesn't. It just takes a great God to get a miracle. And thank God we have a great God. Fallacy about faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Okay? Now, some people, you know, hang on just a minute because you'll think I'm in heresy. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. No, it doesn't. So Pastor Jimmy, you're disagreeing with Scripture. You're going to agree with me in just a minute. I promise. In the Old Testament, there's the Old Testament law. It's the Word of God. I mean, it's in the Old Testament. We're not under the law anymore. Let, let me give you a couple of examples of uh, the Word that doesn't increase your faith. Leviticus 11, all flying insects that creep on all fours shall be an abomination to you. Yet these you may eat of the flying insect that creeps on all fours, those which have jointed legs above their feet with which to leap on the earth. These you may eat the locust after its kind, the destroying locust after its kind, the cricket after its kind, the grasshopper after its kind, but all other flying insects which have four feet shall be an abomination to you. That, that kind of help anybody's faith? Help you out for lunch so you know how to order now? No, that it, the, law, the law destroys faith. The law is about us. Leviticus 13, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when a man has on his skin of his body a swelling, a scab, or a bright spot, and it becomes on the skin of his body like a leper's sore, he shall be brought to Aaron the priest or to one of his sons the priest. The priest shall examine the sore on the skin of his body. And if the hair on the sore is turned white, yuck, and the sore appears to be deeper than the skin of his body. It is a leper sore. Then the priest shall examine him, pronounce him unclean. If the bright spot is white on the skin of his body, it does not appear to be deeper than the skin. His hair is not turned white. The priest shall isolate the one in seven days. Bless anybody? Now you don't want to eat lunch. That's the Old Testament law. It does nothing for our faith. Let me read Romans 10 again in its context and tell you what brings faith. Romans 10, 11, the scripture says, whoever believes on him will be not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich, 
to all who call on him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they've not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? And it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah has says, Lord, who shall believe our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Here's what I want you to understand. The Old Testament law does not increase my faith, but the good news of the gospel increases my faith. My, the, my, the foundation of my faith is the grace of God, not the law. You even have to be careful when you're reading the Bible because it's all true, but there's some of it that's Old Testament law that doesn't apply to us anymore. And when you get too focused on the law, it can actually decrease your faith, not increase your faith. Two more and I'm done real quick. Four, fourth fallacy of faith is faith is the answer to fear. No, it's not. A lot of people say, well, there's fear and the opposite of fear is faith. No, it's not. First John 4. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Second Timothy 1, 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Abraham went to Egypt and he feared because he didn't understand the father heart of God. He just, he just didn't understand that God was his daddy. And when I was a young believer, I had so much fear in my life, it was incredible. I don't have any of that fear today because I know my daddy. I, the love of God has cast out my fear. So the answer to fear is understanding how much God loves you. The grace is the foundation of our faith, not faith. Our faith is not in our faith. Our faith is not in our goodness. Our faith is in the love of God. God who's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us. We need more of God's love and fear is driven away from our lives the more of God's love that we get. Number five fallacy is faith grows as we focus on God. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And so you say, Pastor Jimmy, this is hard for me to believe that you don't want me focusing on God. I didn't say that, but listen to this scripture and I'm done. Exodus 20, all the people witnessed the thunderings, lightning flashes, the sounds of the trumpet, the mountain spoke, and when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will hear, but uh, let not God speak to us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you that his fear may be upon you so that you may not sin. Again, that's Old Testament. That was during the time of the law, but listen to this. The, the devil wants you to have a concept of God that he doesn't love you, he's mad at you, he's, a, he's on the top of a mountain with smoke and lightning and flashes of thunder, and he's very, very austere, that he's very, very ticked, and he wants to put his fear on you so that you don't sin, like in the Old Testament. That, that's what he was doing. Okay? If you have that concept of God, that will not do one single thing for your faith except keep, keep you from coming to God. No one's going to jump in daddy's lap when daddy's mad, right? Hey, this is Brent Evans with Exo Marriage, and I want to thank you for listening to the Marriage Today podcast. We believe your marriage has a 100% chance of success if you do it God's way. If you enjoyed today's teaching and want to keep learning, hey, subscribe to the Marriage Today podcast and take some time to leave us a review. Your reviews help us spread the word and can encourage someone else in need. For more great marriage content, check out exomarriage.com where you can see all of our marriage building resources, articles, and live events. 